everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for a special conversation featuring Olivia Munn. My name is Jasmine Luong. I'm a first year MHA student and I'm one of the co-chairs for Asian Pacific Islander Caucus, also known as APIC for short. Our mission is to provide social and professional opportunities to those who are interested in Asian Pacific Islander issues and concerns that affect a variety of fields like policy, planning, and development. We are super thankful that Olivia could take the time and join us today and talk about topics like Asian and Asian American familial expectations and Asian representation in Hollywood. Olivia Munn is an American actress who began her professional career as a television host for G4, namely for the series Attack of the Show. Since then, she's appeared in a variety of other shows like The Newsroom and The Daily Show with Jon Stewart. She's also been in a lot of movies like X-Men Apocalypse and The Predator. In addition to acting, Olivia also invests in multiple companies. She was an early Uber investor and she also invested in the dog walking app WAG before she ultimately joined the latter company as a creative strategist. Joining Olivia in today's conversation is my fellow APIC co-chair Jonah Chang and APIC board member Rich Shukla. Jonah is a second year MPP student and his main interests lie in the intersections of media, policy, and storytelling, which is apparent in his graduate research assistant position at the Media Impact Project at the Norman Lear Center. He's also a Price Student Ambassador and on the Price of Policy podcast. Ritt is a first year MPP student and he's studying how to incentivize empathy within healthcare and health policy. He's a Dean's Merit Scholar, a member of the DEI subcommittee within GPAC, and he's also a part of the Price of Policy podcast. Thank you all again so much for joining us today, and please send in any questions you have for Olivia through the Q&A function. Also, if you need closed captioning, it's available to enable at the bottom right-hand section of your Zoom menu bar. Great. Well, on behalf of USC Price and APIC, uh, we would like to thank you, Olivia, for taking the time to speak with us today. We're all very excited to have you. Hi, thanks. I didn't know when I was supposed to start the video. <laughs> I'm doing that, no weird, like, that weird intro where I'm just like <laughs> in the wings waiting. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hi, Jasmine. Hi, Olivia. <laughs> and everyone else. Jasmine's my cousin, so I have to give a special shout out to Jasmine. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to obviously echo Jonah. And thank you so much for being here. Um, and I guess we'll just start with what have you been doing in what is it now <laughs> semi quarantine? Where are we? I know it's a, it is a weird it is a weird time. I was actually just telling a friend yesterday. It was like it's really kind of confusing for me because like you know I I like to follow the rules um, and so I am and then then you get kind of really confused by just the conflicting rules that come out and. And then I was telling her, I'm like, I keep seeing celebrities leave Nobu in Malibu. And I'm like, are we supposed to be in Nobu? Are we all like, are we supposed to be doing that? Like, am I supposed to be there? Like, it's, there's a lot of confusion with, um, um, with just what, what level of quarantine are we in? Are, are we all getting out again? Are we supposed to be doing stuff? It's kind of a, um, a little bit of a confusing time. But um, during this time, uh, I think I have gone through the ups and downs and the waves like everyone else. Um, sure. You know, it's, it's been tough at times and, and then kind of really exhilarating at times because you just kind of feel like you're playing hooky from life and then that kind of wears off pretty fast. And uh, then you kind of try to figure out your own kind of groove. Like right now I'm training for an action movie that um, I'm going to be filming in Germany in December. So wow. I've been training uh, pretty much nonstop with uh, actually the John Wick team. Um, so that's been uh, not, it's not the, not John, I'm not in John Wick. <laughs> it's just the, right. like a lot, yeah, a lot the of the team. people. Who, yeah, the team. So, um, so that's been really great because it's been a lot of people who have been, you know, uh, kind of getting me to get out and start working out and just giving myself a, an actual goal. That's been really nice. So I've been doing that. I'm getting my pet nutritionist license as well because I have two wow, dogs. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I started doing that at the beginning of quarantine just because I was like, I need to, I need, I have the time to do this, so why not do it? And so, yeah, that's basically what my life has been. What about you? I mean, I'm in, I'm in Dallas, so it's kind of weird. Um, like, I see people walking outside and like in restaurants all the time. It just kind of feels like I'm in that same state where it's like, what are the rules right now? Um, but. Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, uh, obviously I'm in this master's program now, so 
it's mm -hmm. uh, starting up and I'm excited to get to it. Um, I'm actually gonna hand it over to Jonah at this point. Okay. Hey, thank you again so much for coming to speak with us. We're all super excited. And yeah. I'd like to just kick it off with, you know, taking it back to the beginnings of your career journey. Um, so what initially sparked your interest in acting and in media? Yeah, I have wanted to be an actress as long as I can remember. I remember being really uh, young and watching TVs and movies and um, asking my mom, like, how do you, how do you do that? How can you, how can you do that? And uh, my mom being um, an immigrant, I'm first generation American or um, Chinese Vietnamese. And uh, my mom was just like, that's not, you, you don't, you're going to be a lawyer, a doctor, pretty much those are the options. <laughs> those are my <laughs> options. And, uh, and I also grew up in a family of five kids. So um, being able to make my siblings laugh, I'm the second to the last. So being one of the younger ones in the family, it was such a, a badge of honor to be able to make your older siblings laugh. And so uh, being able to entertain people and be a storyteller, that was something that always really fascinated me and interested me. And so something I've always wanted to, to do. And, um, and I just, I, you know, throughout life as I would kind of pick up on different hobbies or different interests, the one thing that kept coming back uh, to me all the time was this, this love of, of being an actor and wanting to be a storyteller in that way. Come here. Sorry, my, my, my little dog Frankie has been. Oh, hey Frankie. <laughs> yeah, he actually had a, he had a little bit of an issue. He, we had to take him in the emergency room yesterday. Oh no. Oh, no. Yeah. Okay? yeah, yeah, it was a really weird situation. And he was like, he started yelping out of nowhere and then he wouldn't move his neck at all. And apparently he's got mm -hmm. herniated discs, oh, which apparently yeah. happens to a lot of small dogs, but he's okay now. But I just have to, I'm overly, like during this time, I might be like overly cautious on him. Of course, of course. So, <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. So, so being an actor, is something that I just always wanted to do and, you know, growing up, uh, it, it didn't really get to see people who look like me a lot. So, uh, it wasn't something that I felt discouraged about. It just felt like, Oh, there must be a place, um, for me. And actually I remember looking back and, and thinking like, I know how difficult it is to, to be one of these people in movies and TV, but if they can do it, you know, why can't I? So uh, it never discouraged me from not, you know, the fact that I didn't see myself, uh, but it was, it, 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 it was something conscious in my head that I thought, well, you know, maybe there is a place for me because, you know, clearly they, they don't have that spot yet. Yeah, completely. Like, as you were saying, I think looking back at it, I think the only person I could really relate to at the time was like the Jackie Chan animated cartoon. Uh huh. And Uncle, you know, that was kind of like my yeah. like, old language on uh, Saturday mornings. Um, and when you were having like these conversations with your parents, um, and, and especially that you mentioned that, you know, it wasn't really the norm to have a lot of people that look like us on the big screen. Were they at all like concerned about your career choice or what did they have to say? when you told them? You know, I, I went to the University of Oklahoma and I majored in journalism. And I majored in journalism because my mother told me that I could not major in um, theater. Cause she's like, you can't make money as an actor. You can't do that. Like, so I was like, I wanted to be a story storyteller. So journalism was the, the closest thing to being a storyteller. Well, it is a storyteller, but as, if I wanted to be an actor and I wanted to tell stories, well, if I can't be an actor, then I'd like to be a journalist. And I was able to point to the news and to newspapers to show my mom, like, this is a real job. This is what people do. And so she gave me her blessing on that. So then I went down that road. Um, but I never stopped wanting to be an actor. So my mom made a deal with me. She said, um, if you, as long as you go to college and graduate, and use your degree for one year, then I will support you going off to try acting. Now, I have had a lot of actually my white friends ask me like, but couldn't you have just done it? Weren't you an adult? But, you know, I, you know, I, I find that I find that it's a very traditional and Asian families to really want the, the blessings of your parents. And so even if I could have gone off on my own, I really wouldn't have felt good about it unless my mom said, you know, uh, I give you my blessing and you should go try it. So um, I majored in journalism. I graduated. I used my degree for one year at the NBC affiliate in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
and um, it was getting down to the to the year mark, and I uh, I'm starting to get a little bit of the anxiety that you feel when you know something big's about to happen, and you decide you know you're gonna you know go left or go right or just stay in place. And and my sister actually said something to me. My older sister, she said something that I don't even think to this day she realizes how impactful it was. She said, um, she was, oh my gosh, mom said the funniest thing to me the other day. She said, hey, um, if Olivia tells you that she wants to go to California, just tell her next year, next year. That's what I've been telling her. And eventually she'll just forget and she'll just be here and stay with us. And my sister said that to me, like, isn't that funny? Isn't mom crazy? And it impacted me because my mom had been saying that to me. But it wasn't so much what my mom was saying, it was how much I was accepting that. And I had this realization of why I think people don't ever go for their dreams. And I think for me in my head, I thought, well, I can actually see my life. I can say that like in 20 years, I'll still be in the same place. Who knows where my life would be, but I'll be able to say, oh, I could have been an actress, but my mom stopped me, or I could have done this, but my mom stopped me. And that would be what my life would be made of was a lot of, I could have been this, I could have been that, but someone else stopped me. And so I realized that for myself, just, just asking if I could go, just asking for permission was enough for me. I was allowing myself to, to say, I did my part. And if my mom didn't encourage me or didn't say that it was time for me to go, well, then that was her part. And I realized in that moment that my life, my whole journey, it's all on me. So if it doesn't matter if my mom says yes or no, um, if, if I don't go off and try, I'll never know. And that, you know, I could have been an actress, but my mom stopped me wouldn't actually be an accurate statement. It was like, I could have been an actress, but I was too afraid to try. I could have been an actress, but I allowed my mom to let me stay here because I was too afraid to try. And uh, and so it was a year to the day of uh, my time at this NBC affiliate. And uh, I sat my mom down and, uh, well, I actually sat down in her bedroom and she was putting laundry away. And it was an interesting moment, something that's actually stuck with me for a long time because I have an expression uh, that I came up with called uh, life happens on a Tuesday <laughs> because it was a Tuesday that this moment happened with my mother. And um, because you know, it's not the birthdays and the New Year's Eve and the Christmases that you remember, at least for me, it's, it's like life happens in you know, the middle of the week, you know, on a Tuesday for me. And I remember my mom was putting her laundry away and I was um, sitting on her bed and I was building up the courage to say it. Mm. And I just said, mom, uh, it's been a year. I used my degree like you told me I needed to and I wanna go to California and try to be an actress. And she just says, okay. <laughs> I, I was like, uh, uh, I'm like, cause I'm, I'm, that means I'm going to leave and go to California and quit my job. And she goes, okay. And she just keeps putting stuff away. And then I just break down crying. And then she turns around and she looks at me. And she's like, why are you crying? I said, you can go. And I said, but what if I don't make it? It just came out of me so fast. I don't even think I even realized that like I felt those concerns. And she said very simply, well, then you just come home. And the fact that she said it like that, that was the, the, the key that unlocked everything for me. It was that feeling that no matter what I did, my mom would always love me. No matter what I did, there'd always be a home for me to come home to. And that means that I should go explore and try and um, experience life. And failing is not a failure. It'd be a failure if I never tried. And in that moment, it was all, it literally was a well of confidence that I needed uh, just because I knew that my mom wouldn't look at me as a failure. That was the biggest thing for me. And, uh, and then I started, you know, planning my, 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 my trek out West for gold as everybody goes <laughs> out West for gold. And I, and I, um, and that's basically what, you know, it wasn't that she was a big believer in it. It's just that she, um, she just, you know, it was just, it, honestly, the thing is that she, my stepfather, he is an eye doctor, but he had wanted to be an actor at one point. Oh, wow. And he had, um, when, my, when I brought it up to them, I think he told my mom, 
you know, like you should just let her go try. Cause I never got to try. So you should let her try. And I think that my mom just was like, okay, you can go. And it all just kind of worked out. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't want to hop in here. Um, you know, really highlighting the point that you made about how I think something that's really interesting is how we have, you know, different cultures, especially like, like Asian culture being like very collectivist and like American culture being very like individualist, right? And how there's like a lot of tension between that sometimes. But I think something that's a great experience of being, you know, like my parents moved here from India and like having that first generation status is being able to navigate through those identities. And sometimes like, you know, you do get the best of both worlds. And I think in to some extent, like, you know, you were able to get that support um, and the push for going to do what you want because of, you know, living in America. Right. Well, that is a, it's an interesting um, thing that you're talking about because, you know, our, you know, for our families to take this big jump to come to America and to immigrate here, that takes so much courage and bravery. Right. Um, and then I think that there is, it's like, we've made it this far and then, they, at least for me with my family, they really want to just, my mom always just wanted to make sure that I'd be okay. She wanted me to have a job that she felt would always be good for, for me and give me stability and, you know, probably be good for the family as well. Everything would just be like very, um, you know, cohesive and that it would, it, everything would, basically it was this idea that we can, we got to America, we, 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 we put down roots, we have our children, now let's try not to rock the boat anymore. Um, but inside, inside, I do believe that that's something that my stepfather helped tap into my mother and that I helped tap into my mother, which was the, the thing inside that I think gets buried um, with you know, trials and tribulations, that thing inside her that um, gave her that bravery to come and to say like, you, we have no idea what's across that ocean. We have no idea what's across that mountain, but um, you know, I do know what's on this side. So, you know, we got to take that, that, that chance to go, to go the extra mile. And um, it is an interesting thing with the, the, there's um, something that I, I like to think about instead of like, there is a fear there that I think is a collective fear when you are the minority in a country and um, you want to uh, be seen as like, people who are coming to add to the fabric of our country and to um, bring something that's really worthwhile to, um, to, to the, sorry, my dog keep, Frankie, what are you barking at? He's, I think he's either rooting with me or he's telling me to shut up. Um, but, uh, you know, it's something that's like, we, we, so then I think we are conditioned to kind of, um, take our place in, in whatever we think that this, the world has and, and America has uh, forged for us. Like, okay, you're from India. Well, you should be doing these jobs. You're Chinese. You should be doing these jobs. You're Filipino. You should be doing these jobs. It's, there's all these, these buckets that they, we've kind of been assigned. And I think a lot of times we're, you know, there's a lot of gratitude to be an immigrant and to be first generation American. So um, we, I have found myself, uh, in the past wanting to show my gratitude by just doing what people expect of me. But the truth is that we have so much more to offer than just the buckets that have been assigned for us. And um, it's been really great to see my mother uh, let her fear subside and start to feel really um, just very present and very excited about her own life because of her, her children's careers. I mean, my, my sister graduated magna cum laude from law school. My brother is getting his PhD in physics. Um, so we've got the age, that, that side's covered for them. The, right. the, the Asian kids have made her very, that side now, I, I can just go be the actor. But, um, but it's, it's really great to see that, you know, to see that in my mother, to see that the, the pride that she has in not only her children, but in herself, that she, she encouraged us to, to, to aim really high and told us it was okay to fall. Right. I really resonated with what you said, especially, you know, it takes a lot of courage for someone to completely like leave, you know, a familiar place and go to a brand new country. Mm -hmm. Just like along what you said, 
I like am very inspired by like my own parents, you know, the massive risk that they took by moving from Taiwan to Boston, Massachusetts. And it's like through that sacrifice that they made is what really galvanizes me to really, you know, take risks, right? Mm -hmm. Step out of my own comfort zone because, you know, they did it themselves. They took like the ultimate risk. And for me to really embody that spirit, you know, in whatever I do. And it's interestingly enough, you know, when I was back in Atlanta before coming to grad school, I also was interested in acting and I enrolled in acting class. And then when I told my parents like, Hey guys, like I'm enrolled in acting class, they were like pretty concerned. They're like, Oh, are you sure this is like what you want to do? Um, I think just like, right. They really placed an emphasis on, you know, practicality and financial stability because they wanted a life better for mm-hmm. me, which was right. completely understandable. But, um, so what but, are you studying? What are you studying now? Yeah. So I'm trying to like intersect media and policy because I mm-hmm. think policies are like personal stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of them, most of them don't get to be told right. Um, in the way that they should be. Um, so that's what really like inspired me to really try to figure out like similarly to you, right? Like if I don't try, then how will I know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I just remember also like having a conversation with them. And they're like, are you sure this is like, kind of like the, <laughs> the direction you want? And I remember like framing in a way like, oh, like acting class, I just took this for public speaking skills and confidence boosting. And they're like, oh. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you <laughs> tell them. I'm like, Whoo. <laughs> but it's an interesting, I think that especially when you are, it, okay, when I was in college, I, I remember I had two internships and I wrote for, you know, the school newspaper and the, the magazine that was associated with the school. And uh, I took, you know, I remember there was one semester where I just took, took 21 hours and that was the kind, I took at least 18 hours every semester. Wow, so and much. yeah, and I, I don't remember anything. <laughs> I can tell you <laughs> that. I, I don't remember reading a book, no joke, until like, I was like 26. So I'm like, how did I, but I clearly I graduated college and, but, um, but I felt the need to just have a lot of experiences and meet a lot of people because that was really important because I looked at like this time in college as a, as a time to, to develop relationships and connect with people so that um, I could have a better sense of what I want to do when I got out. And also not just a sense of what I want to do, but have connections to that would help me on the other side. Now, that being said, I also think it's important to not feel rushed because right now, if you guys don't have kids, um, if you're married, it's one thing, but if you don't have kids right now, it's, it, it really is a great time. You don't have to worry about that responsibility. You don't have to worry about this. Yes, you may, may have families that you have to help support, but, but there's a big family kind of uh, unit that hopefully is helping within that. But when you don't have your own kids, specifically, I think that's a really big thing that people need to put in their head that it's a time to take risks. Right. You know, it's a time to, to figure that out, go down, you know, because if you decided to just completely abandon policy and go straight into acting and study acting and you realize that that wasn't for you, you could, you still have the time to go back into policy. You can always go back to school. You can always learn that, but you have to, to allow yourself to venture down both paths. Even if that means spinning a different story to your parents about it, you know, <laughs> like let them feel comfortable. I totally understand that, right. but it's a really important thing. Cause I think, I think one of the biggest problems that people face in life is it's not aiming high and missing, it's aiming low and hitting. Mm. That is one of the biggest things that I think you can learn in life is that the problem in life is not aiming high and missing it, or it, the problem in life is not aiming high and hitting, it's aiming low, wait, aiming high and missing is aiming low and hitting. Yeah, because yeah. if you hit, if you hit low, you're there. Right. You you hit it. You, then what? That's it, right? Like that's that's where you're at. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know. Totally agree. Like everything is definitely well worth the risk. <laughs> Life mm-hmm. is the future, and I think we all should go and seize the moment. One hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, there. That's we. You know, there's. I think it's a Bruce Lee quote that said, "There, um, there is no right time. There's just time, and what we choose to do with it." Right. Um, all right, so I, I'm going to hop in a little bit into like Asian representation in Hollywood specifically now. And what I'll ask first is basically, how do you think API 
or Asian Pacific Islander, representation has changed in Hollywood from the time you began your career to now? I feel like it has changed a lot in some ways and in other ways it uh, feels stagnant. Um, you know, when I first came out and I would go out for, for roles, a lot of times I was too white to play the Asian role and too Asian to play the white role. And uh, that did get me down a lot of times. And I, I would see roles that were um, very, you know, ethnic neutral. It didn't matter if you were black, white, Latina, you know, Asian, but they would always go to the, to the white girl. Like that's really what they wanted. And, um, and I, there was times when I did feel very uh, defeated by that and really wasn't really sure like if I could really make a place for myself here. And somebody said to me once, and I cannot remember who it was, but they said to me, I said, don't worry, just keep at it. Because uh, they're like, at first you're just getting the audition. And then after a while, you're getting the call back. And then after a while, you'll, it'll be down to you and two other girls. And then after a while, it'll be just you. If you just keep going on that path. Because at one point you're like, oh, I'm getting the auditions, but I'm not getting called back. And then you're like, I'm getting all the callbacks, but I'm not getting, and they're like, yeah, that's just the steps. And that made me feel good to know that, okay, I'm in it. It may not be happening right now, but, it, but I believe it will happen. And within that, this person also said to me, um, don't worry about trying to um, get the roles where they're, you know, you look, because at the time I'd be getting close to roles and then I wouldn't look white or Asian enough to be matched with the family or the sister. And, uh, and then this person said to me, and I cannot remember who it was, but, um, and it may have been a different person than the first person, but someone said to me, don't worry because one day they'll have to match them to you. And it was just that confidence that somebody else had that changed my way of thinking. It wasn't a confidence that I naturally had. I, I didn't even know how to think that way. But once somebody gave me that thought, it stuck with me and it became part of my DNA. And I lived like that. I was just, I, I, was, I was waiting for that moment, that moment that would come. And I didn't know what shape or form it would come in. But, um, you know, eventually, you know, it, it, did, it did end up happening that way. Um, but when you look at, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander representation. It's, you know, I know it is, it's, it's, it's just, it's still tough because you see people care about minorities right now and put it in and, and representation matters. And we understand that. And that's really important to me, but like, I end up finding that um, there's still, there's still not enough. There's still not enough. And that's not, when I say, when people say there's not enough roles, I don't think that's the, the reality. There's not enough casting of um, Asian American Pacific Islanders in roles. There are roles, there's plenty of roles. They're just, you know, not always going to um, people who look like us, but it is changing and you just get, now I think social media has really helped a lot of times with, um, with movements like the BLM movement or when something seems like it's, it's not right, you'll hear people speak about that. You know, I have a friend who his fiance um, is a, he's from India and he's a doctor and he helped uh, create a show, a TV show that's about Indian doctors. And they wanted to cast the male lead as a white man. And he's like, but that's, but, you know, this is based on my experience. And also um, if you go into a lot of hospitals, there are a lot of Indian doctors. So why, why can't we reflect that, you know, on television as well? And I believe that they lost that, that battle and it was a white doctor placed in that position. But then I saw the other day on TV, there was the, um, what's that one? There's a, I don't know the name of it, but you know, there was like a, it was an Indian man as a male lead of a TV show about, and he's playing oh, no. a doctor. I don't know. And, I, and, um, and uh, he's playing a doctor and it's, and I thought to myself, like, well, that's really great. Like so, there's somebody, 
you know, the more that we people talk about it, the more that people talk about it on social media and, and more that people insist on seeing that and the more that people, you, you know, don't watch the other things and, and only and, and, and force people to give us something new um, and something that represents us, like the more that helps continuing to push open the, the doors for us. Yeah, I think there's like, I think there's a lot of nuance to it, right? And it's frustrating because, you know, we hear all these things about representation and we want better, uh, you know, opportunities. And a lot of the times they exist, but they're in name only, you know? And I think something along those lines of representation is something like Crazy Rich Asians, you know, that represented the first all Asian cast from a major Hollywood studio in over 25 years. And that was the first time that many people saw someone like themselves on screen. Um, did you ever have an experience like that that affected you seeing someone, you know, similar to you? Crazy Rich Asians. I mean, there we go. That, yeah. I mean, it like I grew up watching, you know, like Sandra Oh, Lucy Liu, Ming Na Wen, you know, it was really impactful to see the that was really impactful to see. But to see an an all Asian cast in a rom com was I remember just being in the audience and just laughing and crying and laughing and crying and cheering. And, and I was in New York when I saw it. And, and uh, I remember when the lights came up, you look around, there was like, it was filled with, um, with Asian Americans, but also a lot of white people and black people and Latinx people. And it was really great because everyone is sitting here experiencing just a great movie. And that's what was really um, empowering to me was that, you know, we, we just want to be able to tell stories. That's really all we want to do. We want to be able to tell stories. And, and I think it's really important that, you know, we be given those opportunities because representation matters. It is really difficult to know um, that things are possible unless you see it. You know, it's like when I, when somebody just said to me, one day they will have to cast the sisters to look like you. I didn't even think to think like that until somebody gave me that, that insight and gave me their way of thinking. Uh, and so to be able to see that um, was, was a really beautiful thing with Crazy Rich Asians. I mean, it was so great. And the thing is, it just needs to continue. It was great to see Henry Golding in uh, the, um, the Last Christmas, um, where he plays a, you know, the love interest, you know, as well. So for, to see him to go on and, and, and um, continue to play roles that, that could be typically played by white actors. Prank. Um, that was really, that's a really, it's, so it's just about, yeah, that was a really great moment, but we want to keep, keep that going, you know, you know, um, I was on a, a call the other day and we we're talking about Chadwick Boseman and, um, there's been something that's been said and somebody else said it on the call. They said, you know, it's just sad that once the African American community, you know, they got their superhero, he's taken from them. And I said, but, but you know, why is there only one? You know, why, 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 why has there only been, why, aren't, why aren't we doing more and more uh, stories like this? And, you know, at the end of like uh, Captain America, the last one of Endgame, he, you know, like, I was like, is Anthony Mackie the new Captain America? Cause that would be amazing. <laughs> like, and cause he's an amazing actor. And also that's what we need. And it's, you know, it's, you know, Hamilton really showed us that you can tell stories um, and they don't have to be the same color as the people that, you know, we've typically seen them being, you know, we, we can tell people stories. Right. And just to go off of what you said, like represent, representation truly matters. And I, I remember walking out of the theater after watching Crazy Rich Asians, and it was like a very profound experience for me. I like felt like incredibly seen in a way that I haven't experienced mm -hmm. ever, I think. And just to show that like, APIs or Asians all over the world go through these very normal experiences, right? Like being in love, right? Having fun adventures, right? They can also be sexy, right? Like all of these things mm -hmm. that are finally being showcased in a normal way. Um, and the family dynamic, you know, um, to be able to show it in a way that doesn't feel exploitative um, or just to be satirical, you know, like the, the dynamics between in, within family is, you know, like whenever I see an Asian person, I feel very connected to them um, immediately because I just know that your upbringing is 
is very similar to mine. Even if we grew up in different parts of the world, it's, there's a, there's something that it's, it's in, it's in our DNA, you know, it's, 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 it's just generations of, of, of family. And, uh, and I really love that, that incorporation in the movie as well, that we weren't just telling white stories. We were telling, you know, uh, Asian stories. Um, and it was still, um, it was still like, you know, if you, if you, you could have changed them out and it could have been anybody, tell, you know, but the, but I think that was what was brilliant about that movie was that you couldn't just change it out. That's what I meant to say is that you couldn't change it out because um, you want to tell stories, I, at least with me, you want to tell stories where it just can't just, it can be like, it can be no one else besides this, these Asians telling this story, which I think is important because so many times have we seen um, non-Asians tell Asian stories, you know, and that's a, it's always seen through like the, you know, the white savior that comes in um, through the white eye. And um, it's incredibly frustrating. And, and, and it's also frustrating because you, you hear people, you know, talk about, wanting equality and wanting things to be okay but then they're the same people who will continue to make certain things that keep perpetuating certain stereotypes um something that i'd actually been wondering about is i wonder do you ever feel i don't know any sort of consternation or any difficulty expressing or being someone who is kind of this icon for the asian community right when you get interviewed i'm sure often you're asked to give big statements like we're doing right here about mm -hmm you know, an entire group of people. And it's definitely not, um, you know, it's not bad or, you know, it's something that you obviously are able to do, but do you ever feel any consternation about that? Or, cause I feel like I have a difficulty talking about an entire, like all Indians, like that to me, sometimes I, I feel like that would be weird for me. It's uh, a great question. When I first started out, it was really important to me to always talk about my Asian culture and talk about my mom and, you know, tell stories about my mom and actually use her, her voice and her accent to normalize things in a way and to, and to show how, how funny and smart she is and how clever she is and to show, you know, my family the way that I see it because I, it wasn't reflected. I didn't see that represented um, in the media. And so when I had opportunities to be doing talk shows, um, you know, I would be talking about my family stories. Now, my family is individual to me, clearly, and not all Asians have the same upbringing, but I think there's a, uh, there's a lot of them that, that do, um, but also it's a way of talking about it. There was like, there's a, in my opinion, there's like, especially being Asian American, there is this, no matter if you're, you know, Japanese, Thai, Indian, you know, Chinese, Vietnamese, there's like a truth kind of serum that kind of, I think that we all, we all have. And so speaking truthfully about my experience with my family or like, I remember one time I did um, a talk show and I, I was talking about how um, uh, I, my, my niece, who was really young at the time, like four years old, she was getting bullied at school and I gave her some advice. She told me one night, she's like, this, you know, Auntie O, this, this boy's been pushing me. And I'm like, oh, what's, what's going on? She tells me, I'm like, what's happening? And she says uh, that this, uh, this boy's been pushing her at school. And I said, well, what did you do? She said, well, I went and told my mom and my mom talked to the teacher. And I said, well, what do they do? And they said, well, they said that next time he pushes me to let them know, um, but they told him not to push me anymore. And I said, okay, well, did did he push you again? She said, yes. I said, so what'd you do? She goes, I went to my mom and told my, my teacher. And I'm just in my head, I'm like, this circle is going to go on forever. So I said, okay, listen to me. The next time you, that boy pushes you, tell your teacher, tell your mom. But the next time after that, I want you to take your hand like this. And I want you to ball it up and make sure your thumb is on the outside, not on the inside, because you'll break your own, your own thumb. And I want you to pull back as hard as you can. And I want you to hit him and don't stop until he can't get up. And then she looked at me with these wide eyes and like laying in bed. I said, okay, good night. Love you. And I walked out and I said to my sister, don't worry. I heard about the kid. I gave her some advice and she goes, oh my gosh, I know it's pretty exhausting. I said, I, I, uh, I told her what to do. She's like, what'd you, what'd you tell her? I go, I told her to hit him. And she got so mad at me. She's like, we do not hit in this family. And I said, I don't know what family you grew up in, but we hit in this family. <laughs> like that's, 
my mom, we had some, you know, my, we'd get, we get the SWATs and we were like in martial arts since we were four. And so all the kids would just battle each other. And it was Mortal Kombat for real in my family. And, uh, and it's funny. So I was telling this, this story on a talk show and I had said that, um, and I was like, cause I think at the time I said, I went to the crowd, like, you know, maybe I asked the crowd, I can't remember, but I remember saying like, I feel like Asians, like we, they hit in the family. And I thought, well, maybe it's just my family. And so I made this general statement, but then also I was like, oh, but it's also my family. And I feel like there are people who relate to it and it's in a, it's a, di in, in a different way. Um, but it was obviously we're much more PC now. And so there's like the whole thing of like, are people hitting and it's fine. Like, but there's a, it, 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 people who, if you're Asian, I think that you kind of understand what I'm talking about. And if it didn't happen in your family, at least you have like cousins or different people you understand. And so there was a little that, that, that kind of truth serum, I think, was important for me to kind of talk about in a way that is not going to be understood by some, but will be understood by a lot of people, I think, who look like me and came up, you know, in the same ways that I did. And I do, I do feel um, not a responsibility, but I just want to talk about being Asian. It, it means a lot to me. It's, um, it's a huge part of my identity. Um, I am half white, uh, but I was predominantly raised by my mom's side of the family, um, which my mom is one of nine children. You know, they came to America um, the day the war ended in Vietnam, like, the, like on the boats, went to the Philippines, came out here. You know, I'm, uh, I'm just like, it's, it, it, I take a lot of pride in being able to, to say that I'm Asian. And to talk about it, and if it if it if talking about it normalizes it for more and more people to be able to um, think about casting more Asians and things um, and giving them those opportunities, then then that means a lot to me. And I have a I just I really love um, I mean I love being Asian. <laughs> it's like it's like what Sandra O oh said, right? It's like it's it's just it's an honor just to be Asian. Like that is like that's how I feel. So I I I understand your feeling of like you speaking about a whole entire group of people, um, which, you know, um, I don't claim to do, but uh, I talk about my experience and I'm proud of being Asian. So I like to, to talk about that as much as possible. Of course. Right. You know, we all have certain elements of a shared culture. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, all right. So uh, quickly here, the last thing I wanted to ask was, do you have any advice for API individuals who are struggling to strive for their passions amongst family expectations, peer, pedor, peer pressure, et cetera? Yeah, the, the best piece of advice is um, what I said earlier, which is to remember that the problem in life is not aiming high and missing, it's aiming low and hitting. If you hit that low target, you may be stuck. You know, you, you got it. You got to try. You got to and, and trying is not just wishing for it and hoping that it works out. It's actually like doing the work, studying, working hard, um, you know, looking at people who are successful in the field that you want to go into and and studying what they do and um, trying to learn from them and make a lot of mistakes. The things that I have learned that have shaped me the most in my life are not the successes, it's the failures. The failures stick with you a lot more and they, it's, sometimes it's hard to shake off, but they keep me from making that same mistake later on. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And also when you, when you do fail and it is inevitable, it will happen. Uh, you have to do your best to learn from those things and then shake off the rest of that, that debris because it will weigh you down. And also the other thing is like, it, it, somebody has to do it. You know, everything is impossible until somebody does it and it's no longer right. impossible. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, be the one to, to change it. it. It's, you know, we're all, here's the thing that I think is one of the most important things for everyone to understand is that the one thing that we all have in common is that I exist as much as you exist. So I may be meeting with the head of a big studio who has so much more money than me and so much more power and can make or break my career with one phone call. But the one thing that we have in common is that 
I'm here and you're here. We're both here on this earth. And my journey may take a little bit longer because I may not have your resources, but I have the same ability to make something great happen just as much as you. So you have to really remember that no matter if you're talking to somebody who looks like you or doesn't recognize you or doesn't see themselves in you, it doesn't matter because you, you are, you are there as much as they are there. Yeah, you're completely right. Like it's up to us to see the change that we want to be, you know, hundred percent. You know, our life is <laughs> our own. So we got to yeah. go out <laughs> and do it. Yeah. You have to, you have to, how will anyone know you're worth it if you don't? Exactly. <laughs> you have to know, even if other people, I mean, even when other people don't believe, you know, I, deal with that all the time like this this business is rejection all the time all of the time and you have like then there's the public rejection there's a lot of stuff but like you have to take the criticism when it's needed right but still know who you are and keep forging forward um because you know how will the world know you're worth it if you don't you have to know it first and once you know it people will just will follow and gravitate towards that and dare to be something different and don't lose yourself no matter what like the thing that makes you you the your sense of humor your your the way that you think your family background all these little things all these moments this is what makes you you right. all of these moments all the struggles um all the joys everything so don't don't lose that once you get that that moment of success and you feel that thing that comes up it's like how do i hold on to this I don't want to lose it. Well, most people become very vanilla and they lose themselves and they just try to like go with the status quo because they don't want to lose this. Always, always challenge the status quo and always bring you with you. Don't leave that behind. Don't fall into the rest of the crowd. Always like challenge yourself to be as much of yourself as you can be. And it sounds maybe a little silly to say that, but it's one of the hardest things is to really believe in yourself and to be yourself and to not get caught up with everything else. And it will happen and it will happen. It will happen and it will happen for the rest of your life. And you'll always have this <laughs> confusion and doubt. Um, but just know that it will come and be ready to, to ride that wave back down to the other side. Right. Right. The learning never stops. <laughs> yeah. Um, before we head into the audience Q&A, is there anything that you would like to share with the audience? Maybe like an upcoming project or an initiative or anything? Um, right now, I'm just, I'm training right now. Um, and, uh, and so I have a movie. I, I don't even know. I mean, it's been announced already. It's called a replay, but we haven't even shot it yet. Um, and there's some other stuff that will be announced later, but nothing right now. Besides people um, rescuing their pets, if you guys are looking to rescue um, or bring an animal into your life, uh, I rescue both of my dogs and um, I'm with the shelterpetproject.org. You can go and look up for, look shelter pets up there. And then also the stay home and foster.org program is really great. So if anybody wants to add a, a new furry friend to their family, please think about <laughs> adopting. Right. Perfect for quarantine too. <laughs> yeah, help save lives. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, we'll head into the first Q and A question from Rick. All right. Um, so we have we have an excellent question here um, about you know how do you feel about the conversations surrounding Black Lives Matters within our families? Right. Like typically they aren't automatically on the same level as maybe people um that uh that we feel and like that those conversations within the greater asian community if that makes sense mm, can you elaborate more specifically yeah my bad yeah, yeah yeah i mean i guess talking about it like i had to talk about it with my parents a little gingerly right i had to come up to them and like explain to them you know it's it, obviously it's a very tumultuous time and bringing up this kind of discussion, uh, I think in line with the things that we talked about earlier, they're more focused on trying to get by themselves, right? Trying to figure out how to live their lives. And putting this conversation in front of them often seems difficult. Um, and I think that 
that might be happening in a lot of families right now. And I wonder if you have any insight into how many, um, how like that, the delicateness of that conversation. I'm really lucky that my, my mom is um, very inclusive and very open-minded and, and my family were very outspoken. And so we talk about a lot of things, um, but I do understand and see what you're talking about, about, you know, about especially families who, who have immigrated to America and, and there is this sense of, we just got to survive ourselves. You know, we can't really, we got to worry about taking care of our family and paying our bills and, and um, uh, that it's hard to, to get people to understand that, you know, uh, there's, that there's, well, I think that they do understand. I think that's the thing. I think, well, let me say, this might not be the right thing to say, but my, my gut instinct is that I think it's, if it's important to you, you talk about it to your, your family and, uh, and you don't ask them to do anything. They don't need to hang banners or go in March or post things um, just that they can hear you and hear how you feel about it um, and have a discussion. I think that's, that's important. I'm going to say, I feel like we, we ask a lot, you know, every, everyone gets asked to do a lot, you know, and I think there is a lot of anxiety that comes with, did I say the right thing? Did I do, you know, remember the, 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 the black, the blackout, the black box or, right. you know, yes. everyone's yeah. like, how did that start? Where did that start? You know, or the black and white photos with the women. The challenge accepted, like, right. Oh man. It's like, you know, there, it's this weird game of telephone. And I think at the end of the day, the biggest change that we want is to happen in, in people's homes and in their hearts. And you just have that conversation with your, your family and not expect them to do anything more than listen. You know, you know, don't, don't push people to, to do something just because you want them to do it. You know, I think that it's, you know, having to understand where everybody else is coming from. Like, look, if people, if you have like a very racist family um, and you might need to make a bigger stance, but I think um, in general, when it comes to this, that there's a lot happening in the world and there's a lot of confusion of what the right thing is to, to do to, to support. And if you want to have these conversations with your families, um, I think they are really great, but um, you know, don't, don't put the bar so high that it's unattainable for people to, to reach, you know, sometimes the bar, like sometimes we're like, and I want us to, you know, go out and march and, and, and start posting this. And then, and you want their mom and dad to hold, you know, put up banners and do all this stuff. It's like, sometimes, you know, just speak from your heart and have that connection with your, your loved ones um, because that's what matters the most. Yeah. I, I really appreciate that answer because I think that, you know, it's difficult to talk about this stuff sometimes, but I think we can all agree that, you know, talking from the heart, right. That's something that we can all agree on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, for our next audience Q&A, um, there was a question about the model minority myth. Um, so the question centered around how did you overcome that myth growing up and even in your day to day as an actress in Hollywood? What is that myth? Model minority? I don't think I even know what that is. So it's basically like the myth that Asians and Asian Americans are just really good all the time. Just like <laughs> keep their heads down. Don't oh. speak out, you know, like just like meek yeah. or shy, right? Yeah. 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 Um, well, I'll tell you that, you know, a lot of it had to do with the roles that I just wouldn't choose. And I have to say, I, you know, the, turning down a lot of projects, turning on a lot of work opportunities, um, that was tough, but it was that I didn't want to perpetuate stereotypes. And if it didn't feel true to me, you know, I'm not, um, my family, they're not, the quiet, polite Asians, <laughs> you know, they, um, my family, they're loud and opinionated and have worked their asses off. You know, my, my mom and her, um, eight brothers and sisters, they came here, like I said, the day the war ended and, um, they didn't speak any English. 
all nine children went off and got multiple college degrees. Um, one worked for NASA. One was a top engineer at Ford. A few doctors in the family, teachers, they have all made something of themselves and they didn't do it by being quiet and, and, and polite. Um, and that's just not my experience. Um, and so uh, for me, it was always about finding projects and roles that I could connect to. Um, but also as an actor, you want to put on different hats and you want to try different characters on. But uh, I just I would never take anything that was a stereotype. And, and that meant that I wouldn't work. And that meant that I was, you know, um, eating my top ramen, you know, for a few more weeks, you know, that was okay. And that I would, I would do those things. Not everybody's in that position or I guess can eat that much ramen, <laughs> but I, uh, um, you know, it, it, you have to make the decision of what your line is. And, uh, and then in this business specifically, there are a lot of white people telling the stories of minorities. Um, and you have to be the one to say, that's not right. That's not accurate. And lead them back to, to the line. Um, so, uh, yeah, I guess it's, I, I do, I do get frustrated when I see other actors, uh, portraying that or, um, cause it's not that it's not accurate. It's just, okay, the way I can say it is like, um, there are a lot of roles that come through for, for um, a, you know, a female character and she may be like very upset about her boyfriend and she's like super panicky and just like always jealous. And, um, and I'm not saying that those people don't exist. I just have seen them way too many times that that's not what I want to add to the landscape of you know, TV and cinema. So it's not that quiet, polite, subservient Asians don't exist. It's just that we have told that story a million times. It's, um, it, it, we need to close that chapter on that and tell new stories. Right. We have way more dimensions to us than a yeah. lot of people see. We're like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we're not just the sidekick or the best friend or the martial arts expert, you know? Exactly. <laughs> Uh, and I guess in the last minute or two that we have here, we have a question about, do you enjoy investing or acting more? Well, that's a great question. That's hard to answer. Um, I would say that investing makes me more money <laughs> than acting. Oh, good. I, you know, yeah. As an, as a woman and as an, Asian woman, I do think that I get paid less. And only only in um, more recent years when I when I took on a couple TV shows where I just didn't, I just one day decided like, I'm not going to do it for any less than this. Just and that's it. And so I basically had to teach my my representatives that they can't bring me anything unless I get this amount of money. And it's not just the money, but it has to be all these other factors as well. But in film, there's a, there's a, you know, there's TV quotes and then there's film quotes and the quote system is actually illegal now in the state of California. So you, they can't go on your quotes, but there's like a, 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 there's a, there's a level of what they will pay people. And the men is usually it's, you know, I was watching that show, Mrs. America on Hulu the other day. And they're talking about how like, oh, you know, women are getting paid, you know, 56 cents to every dollar that a, a man's fan. I'm like, yeah, that's still like how it is, you know, and it's how it, I see it out here. I know what people are getting paid and I know what I'm getting paid. And so that is the frustrating thing um, for me. But when it comes to investing, you know, you put your money in, you believe in something um, and the numbers are there and they come back. If you put this X amount, you get this much, you know, um, in, um, in acting uh, it's, you don't get that kind of return. You know, you can put in a lot more than they'll give you back. And um, that can be frustrating. But when it comes to like what I just love to do, um, uh, probably investing more than, than acting. Um, I just feel like it, it is, it, it's getting a different part of my brain. But I don't know. I mean, right now I'm training for something else. I'm doing this other film. And I really like working with people that, um, are really creative and I get to join their ship and their team and um, 
and be part of their vision. I really like that. And that's kind of these two projects that I'm working on right now um, in pre-production. That's what that's like. So that's really ex it's fun and exciting. Um, but yeah, maybe it, maybe it didn't really answer, but it, maybe it's a tie. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go with that. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. I want to thank you again so much for coming on. This was, this was so great. Yes, yeah, thank of course. You again. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for having me. I, did I answer all of your questions? I feel like I rambled probably a bit. No, no, they were great answers. Yeah, I thought we had, I thought this was a great discussion. Um, but where are you guys all? Who's Texas? Texas, right here. Texas. Jonah, where are you? I'm in LA. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I know Jasmine was going to make her way out to LA, but um, right. not. Um, well, Hopefully when it comes back to normal, we can all get together. Let sense. me know if there's anything else you guys ever need. I'm really excited that you guys have this organization. And um, I think it's so important that, you know, whenever I see Asian Americans, like I said, I just feel so close to them. And I think it's, it's been like, like from the very beginning when I was on G4, like it would, it, it's, they're like little beacons, you know, when I look at, you know, you see your, I see like the, you know, different Asians and I just always feel so like seen and heard. Um, and that you always have people who are like, you know, on your side. I think it's important that we all, you know, always create these kind of groups and, and alliances so that we all know that we're, we're here for each other because, um, you know, and, and until things change, we, we have to keep forging ahead together. Right. We've got to stick up for one another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Right. I think um, so talk. yeah, I want to, <laughs> sorry, my bad. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, again, thank you one more time and thank all of the viewers for uh, tuning in today. Um, yeah. yeah. For all the yeah, questions thanks, that guys. Answered, we'll share those questions. Um, yeah. Thank you for watching from home. Hope you guys all are right. safe and healthy. <laughs> thanks guys. Thanks Olivia so much. Of course. Thank you guys. Bye. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.